we'll go and get started. Um, again, welcome to this uh, this edition of the uh, Patients Program Summer Roundtable Series. I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, uh, Dr. Brian Mittman. Thank you, and uh, adding my welcome as well, and uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, uh, we may have some uh, stragglers joining over the next uh, several minutes. Um, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, briefly introduce the topic uh, and then uh, uh, introduce each of our three panelists. Uh, but again, thank uh, the organizers for uh, our uh, opportunity to uh, talk about dissemination and implementation issues, uh, which for some of us uh, uh, who focus on that phase of the research process uh, are um, uh, critically important topics. Uh, so uh, our goal is to um, uh, continue the uh, roundtable series in uh, terms of talking about uh, the different important roles and contributions for uh, all uh, uh, categories of stakeholders, uh, uh, the roles that they play in the research process. And um, uh, those of us who uh, uh, work at the end of the pipeline, as we like to say, um, uh, after the research findings have been generated uh, and uh, uh, working to help to ensure that those findings uh, achieve uh, their uh, potential benefits, uh, uh, having a, a patient uh, a stakeholders as well as other policy practice leader stakeholders involved in our work is is critically important. Uh, so, you know, many view um, uh, dissemination that occurs at the end of a study as the final stage uh, and one that we begin to think about as we approach the end of a project. Uh, but in fact, uh, we'd like to say that planning for dissemination and the use and impact of our findings is something that we need to uh, start from the very beginning. Uh, and pay attention to uh, early and often. Uh, uh, it's it's a, um, a phase that often, uh, too often is neglected uh, and left until the last minute. And so we hope that our discussion today will um, uh, help to um, uh, change some of your hearts and minds and orientation and encourage you to uh, become actively involved in planning for and conducting dissemination. And I should say that there are two types of dissemination that we'll be focusing on. One of them is the focus of much of the the uh, research and writing uh, and the activities of our panelists. And that is, um, again, ensuring that the results of studies do reach their intended targets and achieve their uh, potential benefits. But there's another form of dissemination for which discussion uh, remains a little bit um, light, uh, but for which there's growing interest. And that is returning results excuse me, research results to participants. Uh, uh, many of us have had the experience either a study participant or as researchers, uh, where we are um, uh, uh, interacting quite frequently uh, during the early phases of a project and up and through the final data collection phase. And we will often hear uh, legitimate uh, comments and complaints from patients who basically say to us as researchers, you were all very enthusiastic and friendly uh, until my last blood draw or my last survey, and then I never heard from you again. So uh, there's a growing movement to ensure that study participants receive the respect and the thanks that they deserve uh, for contributing to uh, research, and that is receiving uh, individual communications at the end of a study containing either their own individual results or a summary of aggregate results. It can vary, but the point is that study participants should be engaged throughout the research project and should receive uh, direct communications at the end of a study uh, rather than uh, uh, being essentially forgotten, for lack of a better word, uh, after their last data collection phase. So um, I would like to introduce our first panelist because he actually is double or triple booked and won't be with us through the entire uh, session. But um, uh, Mr. Joshua Harris is one of the uh, uh, patients program advisors uh, and will share a few thoughts with us now at the opening. Uh, and then, as I said, uh, rejoin us later on in the session. Mr. Harris. Thank you so much, Brian. I appreciate it. Uh, again, my name is Joshua Harris, and I am on the Patients Advisory uh, Community Advisory Board. And uh, a lot of my work is centered in how do we make sure that the intended audience and the uh, most in need of the research that is being done, how do they, how do we reach them, ensure that they get the information that they need, and that we continue to build those relationships. Uh, and so, um, excited to be here. I've been working with the Patients Program for about a year, uh, and oftentimes what we find is that institutions have really smart people who put together a great plan and do great research, but oftentimes struggle with the intended target audience or population. Uh, and so, the work that I do is helping to um, determine and do the work to make sure that we're reaching. Uh, 
we're reaching the community uh, appropriately and we're not just using them when needed, but we're continuously ongoing building that relationship, right? Making the community feel welcome, making sure that we're communicating in a way uh, that's building strong trusting relationships and for all intents and purposes, what I like to call um, uh, engaging using the three C's, ensuring that we're developing uh, the community's capabilities uh, or their skills and knowledge, their connections and network, uh, their cognitions or belief system, and their confidence. So they're confident to engage in a way that's appropriate and not feeling overwhelmed. So uh, happy to be here. Thank you so much, Brian. Great, thank you. So let me offer just a couple of other comments before I turn to our um, uh, uh, two other panelists. Um, so uh, you know the uh, the principle nothing uh, about me without me of course is directly relevant here and that uh, uh, relates not only to the planning and initial design of a project, the conduct of the uh, project, the collection and especially the analysis and interpretation of data, uh, but also the dissemination and sharing of that data. Uh, we also as uh, dissemination implementation researchers and practitioners are keenly aware of the not invented here phenomenon. Uh, and the importance of ownership. Uh, when we plan very large health studies whose findings are expected to offer some relevance for clinical practice, health promotion, uh, public health, uh, we always try to identify upfront the key stakeholder groups who uh, we hope will have an interest and uh, uh, will have, uh, well, for whom the results will be relevant to make sure that they're engaged in the very beginning. What we don't want to do is be in a situation where at the end of a study, we contact those key stakeholders, policy practice leaders to describe our study, explain what we found, and ask them if they would somehow help us to disseminate or publicize or respond to the study findings. Their uh, response too often would be and should be, you know, it's an interesting study. I wish I'd have been involved from the very beginning because I could have offered some helpful guidance or it's an interesting study, but I really don't understand all the details. And unfortunately we have other priorities. I'm sorry, I can't help. If we can engage those stakeholders from the very beginning, they become part of the team that's producing the findings. That level of ownership, of course, commits them to dissemination in a way that wouldn't occur if we contact them after the fact. But again, the, the uh, most important point in some ways is um, the one I alluded to by saying, I wish you had contacted me earlier, I could have offered some guidance. There are many instances where relatively modest changes in the way that we go about designing a healthcare or public health innovation, or the way that we go about designing, conducting our study, that those relatively modest changes would have made the, the study much more relevant to key groups and to not take advantage of their insights and to not have the opportunity to refine the project in the very beginning in order to maximize its relevance and its value. Uh, that's an opportunity that we need to take advantage of. And then the important point, especially for uh, the researchers among us, and that is um, uh, publication in a journal is not the final step of research. It is an important step uh, but, um, uh, you know, and, and for many researchers for whom publications and grants and so on are important, it's again, an important step. Uh, but our goal in conducting research is to improve patient care, improve uh, uh, health, uh, improve patient quality of life and so on. And in order to achieve those desired outcomes, we need to ensure that uh, our findings are acted upon. Just one more comment and point before I turn over to uh, uh, Dr. Julie Moore, and that is that uh, not all research findings have significant policy and practice relevance. Oftentimes the finding and the conclusion that researchers uh, publish in their articles, uh, which is more research is needed, in fact is true, that a relatively small study or preliminary study may give us promising findings, but not with sufficient strength of evidence to warrant immediate changes in practice. So one of the key steps among many in developing a dissemination plan and implementation plan is to determine the appropriate response to a study finding. What is the appropriate follow up? Is that appropriate follow up change in legislation, change in healthcare delivery practices nationally or internationally, or is the appropriate follow up? This was a promising idea. Let's do some more studies so that we can begin to collect stronger evidence 
in order to get to the point where we have um, you know, the uh, strength of evidence that we need in order to change policy or practice. So other points will come up throughout the course of the session, but those are some of the key points that I wanted to pass along. So let me um, uh, turn to um, uh, our second panelist uh, uh, and introduce Dr. Julie Moore. She's the founder of the executive director of the Center for Implementation, uh, which uh, uh, I view is uh, the premier center uh, that is trying to bridge uh, research and a policy and practice and ensure that what the academic community is doing in the field of implementation science dissemination actually is useful for policy and practice. So uh, Julia, the floor is yours. Um, wonderful. Well, thank you, Brian, for that lovely intro. I'm going to do a really quick hello about who I am, share something really fast about dissemination implementation, um, and then hopefully when we have breakouts, you will have lots of questions. So those are the official things about me on the screen, but essentially the key thing is I was trained as an implementation scientist, but became insanely passionate about how can we take the science of implementation and use that so that we can more effectively implement, spread, and scale changes. And so I devote my entire time to doing that. Um, and I do that through the Center for Implementation. And we really see it as kind of our mission, vision, and honestly, our moral imperative to help bridge the gap between this science that says, this is how we can actually implement things at scale. And then there's people who are responsible for implementing things at scale. So let's make sure that they have that information in hand to help them implement, spread, and scale changes. So we do that lots of different ways. We have training and supports. And I want to flag, we have lots of free resources. Inspiring Change 2.0 is a free mini course about implementation science, how you can use it. We've had 7,000 people take it. So if you are kind of dabbling in implementation science, I would say, and how you can use it, that's a great place to start. So maybe a helpful kind of grounding about where we all kind of fit within these different terms we've been throwing around. So the way we see it is dissemination and implementation exist on a spectrum. At one end of the spectrum, we have dissemination. That is the act of sharing information, ideally in this bi-directional way that Brian was just talking about, to increase knowledge, and awareness about things. So dissemination is about increasing knowledge and awareness about stuff, bi-directional. And the practice of dissemination is the act of literally disseminating information. So my guess is everyone on this call probably disseminates information, probably fairly regularly, ideally bi-directionally. But a lot of us don't realize there's an actual science, researchers researching what is the best way to disseminate that information I don't know her well, but I think Isabel is one of those people. And um, they are saying, hey, look, the science tells us if you want to share information with policymakers, this is a better way than this way. If you want to put things on social media, this is a better way than this way. And so we should be drawing from that science to inform our actual dissemination efforts. Similarly, at the other end of the spectrum, we have implementation. That is the act of using strategies designed to change people's behavior. Policies and practices and programs all land on that end. And so the implementation practice is the act of literally using those strategies. But again, that there are researchers like Brian who are implementation scientists researching what contextual factors predict outcomes, what predicts sustainability, how can we best adapt things? And we should be drawing on that science to inform our implementation of practice efforts. And so my job is helping bridge that gap between the science of implementation and people who want to actually implement things or support that implementation. And we do that using kind of four foundational pathways. I will talk about one of those really quickly. Um, the other, I'll flag the other ones are about relationships with Joshua talked about. One is about spreading and scaling. One is about embedding equity. But I'm gonna start with the, one of our first pathways we always start with, because I think it's a really good place when you're thinking about sharing your research, which is how can you actually go about designing what it is that you're gonna share in a way that it will be implemented? We do this through this pathway we call the strategies pathway, 
where we talk about exploring the thing. What is it that you are trying to implement? What's the need and the gap? What are your goals and what outcomes do you want to reach? From there, you might say, oh, I have this guideline or I have this program or a practice or a policy, a thing I want to do. And so there we get into really defining who is being asked to do something differently and what exactly are you asking them to do differently? From there, we want to understand, well, what are their barriers and facilitators to change? Why might people change and why won't they change? And then we like to use behavior change theory so that we pick change strategies, things like education, reminders, champions, communities of practice, audit and feedback that directly address people's underlying barriers and facilitators to change to increase the likelihood they're actually going to change. And super importantly, this entire pathway rests on things like relationships, dealing with power and trust, engagement, which it seems like is super important and covered throughout this entire um, series, and strategic planning, thinking about roles and stuff in the system. So that's a high level overview of the kinds of things that I love to talk about and would love to hear more from you about. Um, and with that, I will hand it back over to Brian. Great, thank you. And because we will have breakout sessions, we'd like to hold, uh, ask you to hold your questions until those breakouts uh, beginning in just a few minutes. Let me add just a, a couple of additional uh, uh, core principles and then I'll introduce our final uh, panelist for her uh, remarks. Uh, so clearly, um, uh, you know, the, the, a key assumption here is that uh, research findings are not self-implementing. Uh, if you build it, they will not come. Uh, the fact that we do achieve publication in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, does not mean that the um, uh, frontline clinicians or public health professionals or health system leaders or any others uh, will begin to change their practice and adopt um, uh, the new findings. So um, that's one of the main reasons for the existence of the field of implementation science, uh, conducting research in this area and for the um, uh, Center for Implementation and uh, the few other groups that are actually uh, doing the hard work of ensuring that that science uh, is uh, used in order to facilitate better dissemination and implementation. Another key principle is, is the concept um, uh, that one size doesn't fit all. Uh, any uh, universal rules or principles that you may hear about how to achieve behavior change and the adoption of new research practices or new clinical practices rather uh, is likely to be true in some instances, but not others. So uh, it's a challenging field because of uh, what the research community likes to refer to as the heterogeneity that we face. All of our research findings are different. Uh, all of the settings that we deal with are different. Uh, the barriers to adoption of new research findings tend to be different, so we need different customized tailored strategies. And then the final point I'd like to add at, the, uh, at this juncture is the fact that those behavior change strategies typically need to be multi-component, multi-level, and multi-stakeholder. It's not a matter of educating clinicians, health professionals, patients or a matter of incentivizing them, or a matter of providing reminders to remind them what to do. Typically, we need to do all of the above. And when we try to change a health practice within a health system like the one that I work in, Kaiser Permanente, we have only so much uh, leverage and ability to affect those practices working within the system. We need to work with outside community agencies and patient stakeholder groups and other health systems and the professional community, the medical societies and others. All of those groups need to be involved in multi-level, multi-stakeholder coordinated campaigns to change behavior. Uh, so again, uh, quite a challenging field, but of course, quite an interesting field. Um, and again, front and center in those uh, uh, groups of individuals, the, the multi-stakeholder collection uh, are the consumers, um, uh, the patients, uh, family caregivers, and others. So let me now, as I said, turn to our final panelist uh, for some uh, introductory remarks. Uh, Dr. Isabel May is the director of the Writing 
Center at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, uh, and has expertise in one facet of the multi-level, multi-component strategies, and that is uh, how we can use the written word as part of our package of strategies to try to change practice and facilitate the adoption and use of research findings. Uh, Isabel, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, Brian, and I'm really grateful to be here uh, with you all. And uh, thanks for all my colleagues for their wonderful remarks. I wrote down already copious notes, so I'm, I'm always learning so much as well. But um, I, I wanted to focus a little bit on, or set the stage from a different perspective and focus on an aspect or a, sort of a new movement or a newly crystallizing movement in sort of the, the science of science communication, which is inclusive science communication. And that is science communication really sort of focused on principles of equity, diversity, um, of trend, oh, sorry, my cat is um, interrupting me here. <laughs> it's been a tough morning. Um, but based on principles of dismantling systems of oppression that are based on racism, on sexism, transphobia, ableism, and all the other many different exclusionary I think paths that we in our cultures have to address, and particularly when it comes to uh, to scientific research, often not so much go um, un, uh, understudied, but sometimes we have our own biases. And so I think inclusive science communication gives us an option to really kind of take a pause and look at um, the entire uh, evolution of a research project and really foregrounding the uh, idea of how to communicate and how to effectively disseminate ultimately the research results. And I love Julia's comment on the bi-directional nature of communication. So let me offer a few, um, few slides and some few thoughts to get you guys thinking about, you all thinking about this, and then I'll have some more support and more structure in the breakout session. I'd also wanted to add that on top of being the director of the writing center, I also am an associate professor of science communication at our university where I direct the science communication certificate program. So if anybody's interested in that, I'll be happy to provide some more information on that, but I didn't want to put too much on here. So a little bit about me and I like to present myself you know, in a, in a holistic way to you about my different identities. Um, the one that we often focus on in academia is the latter part of this whole paragraph that you can take a look at or not. I'm a humanities trained scholar. I come from a American history, American studies background and found my way into writing assessment and writing pedagogy as part of my graduate training and postgraduate training and started working with a lot of scientists. It just sort of organically happened. Um, so I am not a science or healthcare trained person at all per se, but I have over the course of my career worked with lots of people in this field. And I wanted to position myself and I use this, uh, there's a link down here, the social identity wheel um, which um, I'll, I'll drop those links, all of them in the chat once I'm done here before we break out in the session so you can access them there. And I'm happy to make my slides available as well with all the links. But I like to position myself on this sort of spectrum of privilege versus that lack of privilege, right? And so some part of my identities make me very privileged. I'm a white woman, I'm middle class, I'm very, fairly overeducated, one could argue. But I also have aspects of my identity that place me in a position of lack of privilege. I'm a woman in a in a, certainly in a field um, of science where um, there have been histories of exclusion for women scientists and women participating in science and so on. So I um, so wanted to offer that to you and give you a little bit of an idea of who I am. And, it, it, and this, and this kind of interest drives, or this kind of positioning really drives my interest in inclusive science communication, the type of communication being committed to really creating equitable societies and cultures and, and ultimately equitable dissemination participation in the scientific projects that all of you are engaged with, with your research and your participation in research projects. So inclusive science communication really describes any effort to engage people in science, tech or technology, engineering, math and medicine, grounded in inclusion, equity, and intersectionality. So it's a new term that we started using since about 2018 when the Metcalf Institute at the Rhode Island University of Rhode Island started a symposium where a lot of younger researchers and a lot of researchers of marginalized identity backgrounds participated and really articulated um, how excluded they have felt and continue to feel within the scientific enterprise. And these are different, different disciplines, not just healthcare focused folks, but folks from environmental science, from you know, biology, from, uh, from astronomy and so on. And out of that, this, a lot of publications have come out and a lot of material on inclusive science communication, there's three key traits that I think really capture well 
what all of my colleagues have expressed and what I really see from my understanding of dissemination and implementation science really lie at the heart of this enterprise. And those are the key traits of intentionality, reflexivity and reciprocity, right? Really building those pieces into the entire scientific project, the scientific research process is I think key. And I wanted to offer another quick um, slide about you know, how to move forward if we're really taking inclusive science communication seriously, how are we gonna move forward? And so this new framing can invite inter you know, all interested and relevant parties rather than reinforcing silos. And I do wanna emphasize here that um, the, ki the kind of language that we use to describe who's participating is really key. I think there has been a tendency in science communication and in, in, in very specialized fields like so much of healthcare science and healthcare research of thinking of us the experts versus the non-experts, the public. And I think the term even the public is very complicated because it seems like a monolith. So I think there's a lot of encouragement around using public audiences, broader audiences, the term non-career scientists is often used. Um, citizen science can describe something slightly different but similar. So I think that you know how we frame sometimes even with language and the kind of expressions, terms we use to describe ourselves, our relationship with communities, really make a huge impact when it comes to building relationship and you know those three key traits of inclusive science communication and then you know another piece of moving forward really supporting innovation early um, really influencing funders to think of um, equity and diversity is something that is not just added to but it's really built into the scientific enterprise so I'll have some other resources particularly around inclusive language that I'm, I'm hoping to share with you and any questions around. So the science of science communication, especially with an EDI lens, that is something I'm passionate about. And there are so, so many great connections with implementation dissemination science. Thanks. Great, thank you. So um, we've uh, covered a lot of ground, thrown out a lot of ideas, a, a fair amount of uh, buzzwords in, in academic concepts. Uh, our goal now is to uh, make this all much more meaningful and to engage in discussion. So uh, let me turn the floor back over to Joe for uh, a summary of how we uh, plan to use our remaining hour. Yes, um, so I'm gonna create a breakout room um, with uh, Joshua Harris, uh, Julia Moore. Um, so if you want to uh, learn more from them, of course, as we mentioned, uh, Joshua Harris will be coming back in a little bit, but um, you can choose to go to that breakout room. If you'd like to uh, uh, learn more, talk more with uh, Isabel May and Brian Mittman, you can just stay where you are. But I'm going to open that room up. Uh, Julie and Josh and um, one of our volunteers, Kaylee, are going to go right to that room and uh, you can uh, choose to go over there. So I'll do that right now. And just uh, actually, Joe, before you do that, before people leave, um, uh, just a brief summary as to um, uh, you know what will follow. So um, uh, we'd like to give you all an opportunity to uh, interact with both pairs of uh, uh, panelists. So um, uh, Joe, I believe the plan is 20 minutes uh, in this first breakout session. Uh, then we will um, uh, uh, make an announcement and uh, uh, invite you all to switch to the other room if you'd like. And then the remaining 20 minutes or so um, uh, will feature some uh, final comments uh, um, uh, uh, we will uh, bring to the table some of the uh, uh, key points that emerged during the two breakout sessions, uh, allow uh, us as panelists to um, interact a bit if we have any questions for each other, uh, but also uh, throughout not only the two 20-minute breakouts, but that final 20 minutes, uh, we encourage you to um, uh, pose your questions either through chat or uh, uh, by unmuting. And let me, uh, uh, because we have a, a, a broad range of issues, um, uh, let me uh, ask if, uh, well, okay, uh, uh, Mark Moen, let's uh, start with your comment and then um, uh, we'll go to my uh, suggestion. If you could uh, go ahead and un unmute. You can go ahead with your suggestion if you'd like. <laughs> uh, no, it's, uh, uh, let's, let's start with uh, the issues that are of interest to you. So thanks, but uh, go ahead, fire away. First of all, just gratitude. I've, um, I, I happen to have attended some of Isabel's sessions, but I didn't know this background and the resource that you provided just in the few minutes. I really appreciate and and uh, Brian also I really appreciate just the framework of the importance of dissemination. I was just um, it, I just had a comment. It struck me. I was on a call this morning with somebody who does undoing uh, leader of a undoing racism work group and um, has 
done this and work with many health systems throughout the nation and internationally. And I was inviting them to a pre-conference for American Public Health Association on anti-racism. And he asked about data related to the impact of racism on, on the public's health. And I was gobsmacked that this somebody who was expert in this. I mean, he founded this institute and he knows it well within, you know, the, the cardiovascular health, or in, but the breakdown of between the public health um, people and the people working and organizing against racism, it, it's, it's astounding. So I just can't thank you enough for bringing this critical issue to us and helping us give tools to really start addressing this because it, it's, it's critical. Let me offer a couple of comments and then Isabel ask you to react as well. So, um, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, as many of you know, there's been a um, relatively major uh, uh, evolution in the way that research is uh, documented and um, summarized. Uh, and we've gone from informal reviews to, um, you know, lots of systematic reviews and, and other forms of um, activity that attempt to get a handle on, uh, you know, we've all seen the graphs showing the number of scientific publications per year uh, that, you know, continues to uh, grow at an astounding rate. And now with open access journals and all the others, it's moving even faster. So there's just no way that any of us can, you know, keep tabs on all the research that's done uh, in our fields, um, uh, even uh, in, in terms of its research implications, let alone the policy and practice implications. So uh, there has been progress, but there's still much to be done. Uh, and just to uh, maybe stimulate some uh, uh, more creativity, uh, there have been some proposals floating around for the past several years that we uh, essentially do away with um, uh, research journals the way they're currently published uh, and, and um, uh, constructed, uh, with the argument that too many research uh, articles are good pieces of literature, uh, but um, don't necessarily provide the information that's needed in a format that's needed. So one proposal is that all research studies be reported in some sort of living, growing database in a very systematic way with the key features of the studies summarized in a set of columns, and that that database include tools that allow you to produce automated summaries at any point. Uh, the function of journals then may turn to not the uh, uh, task of summarizing research, uh, I'm sorry, uh, you know, publishing research and reporting it, but instead summarizing and uh, analyzing and interpreting. So the journals would be, uh, you know, written for uh, practice audiences who need to understand and keep tabs. So anyway, the, the point is that this is still a work in progress and the task of uh, you know, reporting and synthesizing uh, research remains at a you know relatively early early stage of development, and the problem's getting much worse. Uh, Isabel, your uh, thoughts on on uh, you know the original comments and uh, any <laughs> lots of thoughts. Mind? Yes, <laughs> thanks, Brian, and uh, absolutely, Marik. And I think um, you're raising an important issue, and you know I agree with you, Brian. I think there is such a wealth and an overwhelming amount of information around probably any subject out there but especially health that it's hard to keep up with everything and at, at the same time though I'm like so why is it that we have a hard time keeping up or we have folks who are leaders in their field who tend to be and you know tend to be most likely or in many cases maybe not I, on, of marginalized backgrounds predominantly so a lot of white men and white women is when we talk about race in particular and we, we have blind spots on, right? We have, you know, and I can talk openly as a white woman, I have blind spots when it comes to racism. I don't have the personal experience. So I really need to do a lot of work on my own to figure out how to get rid of those blind spots and listen and, and really read, read folks' work. And so, because the, the work is there, there have been, and you know, scholars of variety of backgrounds have worked on the intersections of social determinants of health, issues of race, equity, access, healthcare, the studies are there. They're often though, not necessarily, or they're often studies with, from, I find from my, from my experience and own reading and working with folks in those areas, they often tend to be a um, mixture of quantitative and qualitative. So they might not always rank as high in sort of this traditional hierarchy of investigations, which you know is maybe something that we need to deconstruct. So I think, so there are lots of issues I think that 
preventing some of these studies to really get as much um, as much exposure. And recently, there have been studies by the, both the NSF and the NIH, I believe, have some longitudinal studies on looking at what research has been funded and what kinds of researchers have been funded historically by these two big funding agencies. NIH, of course, predominantly for healthcare focused medical research, but the NSF also for lots of research overlapping with that. And there is a trend that researchers who are, um, who are not white and not male tend to get you know, not, not nearly as much funding as frequently as white males. And I think that's just, a, <laughs> I'm not so necessarily surprised, but so, and I think that these funding organizations as well as others are really wanting to change that. But so I think we're at this sort of watershed moment, finally, I can say, um, where hopefully we'll see some change and these conversations are bubbling up, but the work has been there. Um, you know, and I encourage folks to look at, you know, Twitter in particular, this is where I get all of my, a lot of my information by researchers who might not, you know, who do some of the work in the margins of their fields and they're margin, often marginalized. And so we got to start paying attention to that. And I think that goes a little bit beyond my field of computer science communication, but it's part of that, right? So how do we then foreground, even in the, in our conceptualization of studies, whom we're including, excluding. One example is like, we've been doing some research in my, where well, the writing center is part of a student affairs program or student affairs suite in at the at UMB. And we've been doing some, um, uh, uh, what do we call them? Campus climate surveys with our students. And so when we present our data, we often exclude, let's say indigenous Americans or in, American in the native Americans because our population size is so small. But then there's indigenous scholars who are really questioning it as saying, yeah, this might be significant, not significantly statistically, but these voices are still there and we need to hear them. So, so just as an example of how quickly we can dismiss the experience of people because in our world of statistical significance, they don't really fit in. And if we do this consistently and systematically, which I think we have done as a country and a nation, we, you know, we get into some really tricky situations where during COVID, I think it blew up all in our face, where suddenly we're like, oh my God, there is a real issue here with health disparities based on different forms of identities that peoples have and intersectional identities, of course, as well. So those are my comments on that. <laughs> so just a couple of quick uh, implications, if I may, of, of uh, you know, both sets of comments, one of which is, uh, you know, the all important role uh, of um, uh, stakeholder engagement. You know, each of us, uh, you know, the saying that each of us, uh, you know, touches and understands a small part of the elephant is certainly true here. And without, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, interacting with, um, you know, representatives from all of the different groups uh, in the target audiences for our dissemination, but all the different groups who have an interest in the research, uh, you know, there's no way that any of us as individuals or even small teams uh, can truly, you know, plan and understand what is needed to effectively communicate the uh, research findings. Uh, another key point is the need for us to uh, look to other fields for ideas and inspiration. So um, for the most part, medical research is doing quite well, uh, you know, relying on the tools, the methods, the ideas and approaches from medical research. But when we deal with dissemination, science communication, that's not at all the case. And much of what we uh, need by way of new ideas and creativity and, and uh, approaches uh, we can find from other uh, fields. Uh, one somewhat related example, Isabel, that your comments um, uh, brought to mind is, um, uh, you know, what I remember reading now years or decades ago about um, uh, racism and um, inequities in um, uh, the audition process for uh, symphony orchestras uh, and the discovery that when you had the um, musicians audition behind a screen, uh, and what typically were, you know, the older white male members of the orchestra in the 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, not see the gender. Uh, lo and behold, uh, some of the decisions were a bit different. So there are creative solutions, again, from other fields that we need to uh, seek out and uh, uh, import into our uh, field in order to, um, uh, you know, overcome many of the challenges. And I should say that uh, the field of dissemination, implementation, science, and health has been very active for 20, 30 years, and uh, we're nowhere near any findings. You know, if, if anything, we've discovered more about the challenges. So the points I made earlier about the heterogeneity, the need for multiple strategies, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, we're gaining a much better understanding of the magnitude of the challenges, but unfortunately not quite as much progress as we would like in determining how to overcome those challenges. 
Uh, other questions, comments, please. So the suggestion that I wanted to make is um, to ask if any of you have any thoughts or any experience on the other issue that we'd like to um, talk about, and that is um, uh, returning research results to participants. As I said, uh, it is uh, relatively early in development. There are some toolkits that have been developed. Um, there's a group at Vanderbilt, a group at Harvard, uh, USC is working in this area, trying to help us as researchers understand how to communicate findings back to the participants. Uh, we're a long way from convincing IRBs to make this mandatory. But do you, any of you have any thoughts or experience um, and strategies for trying to encourage more research teams to commit to returning results to uh, participants? Uh, Maria Mazi, I see your hand up. Yeah. Um, before, uh, when I was uh, educated uh, in the IPR, interpersonal relationship, uh, and uh, it was uh, opening com communication with patients, and uh, we have also to plan for the closing. And during this research also, it is a relationship between the uh, participants and the researchers. So how we can reach this closing uh, phase? Isabel, some thoughts from you? You go ahead, Brian, you take this first. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, you know, short answer is I'm not sure that, you know, again, uh, you know, as with the, the broader challenges in dissemination implementation, I think we're gaining a much better understanding of the problem, but um, uh, not uh, any solutions. Um, uh, others uh, uh, in the room, uh, thoughts, responses from you. We need your insights and experience. Um, this Di is Jim Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Jen, uh, Diane. I won't come to you. You raised your hand. Uh, Jenny, yeah. Did you have a comment? Uh, just at the Duke Clinical Research Institute, we some of our programs regularly do lay summaries. It's it's not a hard sell. They're not expensive to do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you have a communications team already writing up medical helping with medical editing or things like that, taking the extra step of designing an engaging thing. Um, is not that hard. I think what's tricky for me, we worked on a project on um, masking in schools last year. Okay, well, that was hot. Like people wanna know that. So you create these lay resources and it's not a hard sell to actually get media to pick it up and to really get it disseminated out there. I think the challenge, <clears throat> I'd be curious, and you hinted on this earlier, was um, when you have that incremental the results are like some kind of incremental, like need more research is needed. It's not clear. How relevant is that? You know, on in principle, you should do it, but how do you, how do you package that up in a way that's meaningful um, for not only participants, but anyone who could be affected by that? So sorry, I, I didn't give you an answer, just more questions. <laughs> Diane, did you have a question or comment? Yeah, comment, I guess. I'm working within a, a large biopharmaceutical company right now on the diversity in clinical trials, clinical ops team. So this company is really making this effort, um, including language. But what I'm learning is, what I'm finding is that it's not just one thing that's going to make a difference. There's a whole structure that has to shift to get the brains thinking, okay, yes, lay, lay, uh, plain language summaries are good, or how we close the, sub, how we close the study uh, makes a difference to the participants. I mean, even just calling people participants instead of subjects, there's so much of the structure that has to change to even be open for all of this. Do you, do you have any thoughts around that? I do, Diane, and um, gosh, you know, I. I think language is certainly where it starts, um, and uh, and it's one way. I, I do think that. So I think one of the and this is coming shamelessly from so some of the humanities background. I sometimes find when it comes to, um, especially at the beginning stage of designing a project, um, I think we tend to stay within our um, disciplinary silos a lot, right? And rightfully so because they need the expertise. So there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. And I think at the same time, 
I think we need to really start thinking critically about whom else are inviting to, you know, to the table to talk to us a little bit about approaching things methodologically. And the, the, the link that I just shared, and I think there was an error in there, apologies. Um, this is from the National Academy of Science, oh, let me get this right, the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, NASEM. Um, they've had this wonderful colloquium, a workshop just this year on, um, uh, what was it called? I have to look up the full name, but it was um, on uh, mitigating, let me see, mitigating racism. Um, uh, it's, it's I, pu I put it in there and there's one great lecture and it's like video number 14 by Dr. Paris A.J. Atkins Jackson, who's over at Columbia. I would really encourage everyone to take a look at it because she's really encouraging us, encouraging scientists and public health scientists in particular to really think about getting sociologists, historians and so on involved in from the early process on. And I'm not saying this because you all need to go job to us historians, which I think you should, I'm kidding, right? But I think that that is necessary because we're dealing with, with issues like the issue of masking in schools. I mean, that is a powder keg, right? And, and all of the issues with schools and, and identities and all access, accessibility, all this stuff comes in there. And, and thinking that complexity through, having somebody trained who, who works on sort of social structures more than necessarily just sort of the, the science, I think is critically important. So, you know, and this is at a day and age when we see the humanities program, social sciences programs being eroded in our public education system, especially in colleges. And I see that as a problem because I think we, that piece of education is extremely important to kind of, you know, to help us think through these problems that, geez, affect us all. I mean, this planet is in, on fire, right? <laughs> at least judging by those red maps that we see, but you know, there a lot of these issues affect us all. And so I think we need more voice at the table in terms of disciplinary backgrounds as well as other areas. So that would be an encur I would encourage you know you all to think of that. If you don't have these folks working with you in some way, shape or form, you know, this needs to be something. And I think that funding agencies like the NIH, NSF need to really think more broadly about who needs to be involved in this scientific research as well. Thank you. Sure. Joshua, did you have a response to, so Alita asked a question kind of twice right before we got thrown out and I see her here. So I'm wondering if Joshua, do you have a response that you want yeah, to share? Uh, no, absolutely. Uh, I was going to say um, that you're absolutely right. Uh, unfortunately, it is those communities that are oftentimes targeted. Uh, and so there isn't necessarily an organization or institution that does that work, uh, but for me and for the work and organizations that I've done with the NAACP and as a community organizer by training, uh, we are responsible and accountable to the community for any decisions that we make and any introductions that we make in that work. Uh, and I think that um, there are several other organizations that uh, that is their aim and their goal um, to be responsible and accountable to community to ensure that uh, there is not, um, that they're not being taken advantage of. And Several organizations do that, not just in this space, but also in like policy space and um, legal space or law or organizing around changing laws and policy solutions. Uh, and so I think that uh, there, that's probably something that needs to be done as some form of body um, for oversight. But for now, as far as I'm aware, it's just working with organizations that are accountable to the community and not just themselves. Uh, and that's the most important part and critical part of that. I hope that answers um, your question. It does, and uh, sadly, that's what I had assumed you would say. <laughs> um, yeah. I, no, I just wish there was more oversight, that's all. Um, and yes, I, I appreciate your answer um, and that the, the assumption that there are organizations that are gonna be accountable, but unfortunately there's always this after the fact, there's this unintentional piece. And um, with this type of effort, when we're talking about people's health, it would just be um, a nice idea for lack of a better adjective that some forethought was given on the front end so that we don't figure out 20 years later, oh, by the way, X has happened. Um, Cause that type of, and we see it with yeah. like for profit university schemes. Do you know what I mean? Like if there's, I'm just saying that if it's, there's a way. It's one of the largest reasons that the black community is distrustful of the medical industry because of historic <clears throat> situations is 
recent is 2017, absolutely. Correct. Um, so absolutely. There, right. there's very limited oversight. Um, right. Yeah, and it's something that does need to happen. Unfortunately, absolutely. no body in existence. And we're also talking about one of the largest lobbying groups in the country uh, for that matter. So there's that as well. Um, and so, but we won't, that's a conversation for another day. Oh, for those of us who just joined, I missed the question. I heard the answer. It's kind of like Jeopardy. Could you read yeah, yeah, Sorry, the question? The last who's the largest lobbying group that we're talking about? Yeah. Medical so the, pharmaceutical industries. We, we, that wasn't the question. She was talking about oversight of accountability for communities being engaged in different uh, aspects of research and work. So is that also considering the IRBs that govern the clinical trials? Because there is some responsibility there. I think her question was really about the fact that because people are engaging communities, what about the risks to communities? And is there anything like, do you have like, she literally said like, do you have like a checklist of things communities should ask before they're even participating in this? Because it seems like there's a lot of potential risks for certain communities to raise their hand and say, hey, I'm gonna help, but like, it's not, it's not all positive. And so she asked originally me if I had like a checklist and I was like, I don't have a checklist, but I think Joshua might have more insight um, to that. So that's where that came from. Okay, now I understand, thank you. Amazing, so anyone else have questions, thoughts? We had um, some questions in the other room about return of results. I don't know if that's something um, that the two of you have had any experience with or something that has become more, um, something that's more on the front of mind as a way to, you know, can continue to engage participants, engage communities. That's something that's been uh, becoming a bigger issue or something that, that you can potentially embrace. Um, for dissemination and implementation? I would say from my perspective, I think that both, I think that return of results is kind of like an essential piece and part of where things are going. But I actually think that if you really truly effectively engage partners from the beginning of a research project, you don't have to have a return of results stage because you actually truly care about them. They're truly part of the process. Do you need an effective communication plan? Should you make sure that someone regularly sends an update, tells you what's happening? Absolutely. Um, but to me, like that's a general, like someone I submitted, someone submitted a grant two years ago. We were partners, we wrote a letter of support. They emailed me two weeks ago to say, hey, could we have a call and could you facilitate our first session? And I said, I haven't heard from you in two years. I didn't know you got this grant. Could we have a call to talk about what the grant is, what you've done? And then we can talk about how we could facilitate a session on barriers and facilitators. But to me, like that's not a project that's probably, that they might need a, a, a return of results because they haven't been engaging people throughout. But I think if you engage people throughout, they, they know they're part of the team that is doing this work. I totally agree with that. And it should be about establishing um, long-term relationships and not just when something is needed. Uh, and particularly if you're going to be working with and engaging the community, uh, people aren't stupid. They're keenly aware that you need something and that's why you're here. And I've been in community meetings where people are like, you only show up. Uh, even with some of our anchor institutions here in Baltimore, they're like, you only show up when you need something welcome back, what is it that you want, right? Um, and so that creates a, because there's not that ongoing engagement, actual relational component to where it's like, okay, how can we help you as well? Uh, or what can we do to support and like having that ongoing? Because the reality is that people uh, don't care how much you know until they know that you actually care. Uh, and that's often the most critical ignored part uh, when working with community uh, is that people just assume, oh, people should want to help. And it's like, why? We have our own problems, right? We have our own things that we're dealing with. We have two and three jobs that we're working. Um, what is the relational component of this to make me feel like this is authentic and that you are trustworthy, right? Um, as uh, Daniel says all the time, like wanting to be trusted does not make you trustworthy. Right. Uh, and so you have to prove yourself to be trustworthy when engaging and building these relationships. 
I see a hand, but I want to flag two things that I think Josh, you just mentioned that are, I think are super, super key. One of them is, I think this is one of my favorite um, spectrums that we talk about related to spectrums of collaboration. And I think that if people truly sit down and say, we're all agreeing, this is where we are on this spectrum. This is the kind of relationship we want to have with patient partners, with community partners, with other institutions, with other researchers. I think we would all like, let's lay it out and talk about it. And what I, my favorite thing about this is the Tamarack Institute spectrum. And I think the reason I like it so much is they go all the way to compete because let's be honest, sometimes people are in direct competition while collaborating and like, let's acknowledge that's happening instead of like dealing with all the chaos that ensues when that's going down. So I'd say that's the first thing. And then I think the second thing you mentioned, Joshua, that I love is like the importance of trust. So when we build courses related to implementation and one of the biggest barriers people were having was navigating power and figuring out how to deal with, how to build trusting relationships. And so we literally built out a course on cultivating trust and navigating power because at every single implementation, every single dissemination requires trusting relationships. But none of us were ever trained in like, what is trust? What are the three core components of trust? How do you actually build trust? What does the science say we should do that? And like, when we started building it, I I thought like, this should be foundational for everyone in the world to learn. Because if that's the core of everything we do, how are we not talking explicitly about there's a science of how to build a trusting relationship and let's figure out how to all do that together. So anyway, so two random things, but yes. Um, what is your question, thought, reflection? Julia, I have a question for you. So, I mean, I, I think we're all in agreement, but I, I think the biggest issue I think is uh, before trust, I think there's biases that we have to overcome. And I, I think that's where I think society, um, because research is one part of healthcare, but I, I think bias to me is something that needs to overcome before you even think about trust. So how does your organization sort of speak to that aspect? Because there's bias in healthcare and there's also bias in research. I mean, we're, we're talking about diversity and inclusion because there was bias in research and bias in healthcare. So I think before we think about trust and engage in the implementation, I think how do we sort of address the issues of bias, which is shaped by society? Oh my goodness, that is such a good question. So um, we spent a whole bunch of time over the past year doing a lot of work on figuring out equity and implementation and like how they fit together. Um, this is the equity iceberg that we love using. Um, and it talks about how like you have actions at the top and this is like planning for implementation things. Underneath that is relationships. So this is where all that power and trust lives. Underneath that are the systems and structures that we have, right? Like the institutions that was in the last breakout, they were talking about like funding structures, but that underlying all that are the mental models of how we see the world, which is where all of our biases and our beliefs and our value systems fit in. And that these are like under the water, but really drive absolutely everything that happens above. Um, so I am not an equity expert. We are trying to embody equity in our implementation work, but I am not an equity expert. So I would say our approach has been to try to find questions that we can ask every stage of the implementation process to better consider equity along these dimensions. Um, and I can send a link to the questions that we've developed based on that, but I wish I had a better answer than that. And, and I think the willingness for institutions and, and researchers to have open and honest dialogues uh, about where those biases exist uh, is critical uh, in order to build that trust. Yes. Uh, like we have to be willing to have those conversations and what we like to call clearing sessions at the NAACP, talk about, okay, this happened, what has been done since then uh, to change and to put protections in place or uh, to build beyond that. And so um, I think that that's critical and sometimes they're uncomfortable conversations uh, when we're talking about biases and we have to be willing to have those uncomfortable conversations if we truly want to be equitable in the work that we're doing uh, and ensure that we are serving the most vulnerable populations. And uh, Joshua, I think that your, your comment speaks to Marie's question. Any thoughts on more frequent violence and disinformation making people 
uh, more leery of everything and everyone. Do you think it's a harder time right now to build trusting relationships uh, to implement and, and disseminate and pretty much create these community level partnerships? Absolutely, it's a very difficult time to uh, build those relationships. Um, we're in the age of information does not always mean accurate information, right? Uh, we also, uh, there's just, it's very difficult to build those relationships and to get information, the accurate information to people and get in individuals and organizations to trust. Um, and I think that um, as uh, um, I have a mentor that often says in, in God, we trust everyone else brings data. Um, that's important to be able to bring uh, validation, to be able to validate what you're presenting. Um, um, but also understand that there is, uh, again, as we talked about previous, that sometimes even in that data, there's implicit bias that exists, right? Uh, and those who pull the data that the research may not even know or be aware of it, as we found out over and over again uh, in times. And so just being aware that uh, this is all a learning experience uh, and being honest about that, I think, again, is, is critical. Like, it's OK to be wrong. I can deal with you being wrong. I can't deal with you telling me that you're right and then not admitting that you were wrong about something, right? And I think that that's where it's important, too. And sometimes we think, and, and that from the community perspective, uh, it's important for us not to feel like, oh, just because you have a PhD and this is what you do, that you're right about everything. Because that's not always the case, right? This is a practice. This is a learning experience for everyone. And I think being able to acknowledge that, that you may have a PhD in your expertise in your field, but it may not be in community and community engagement and his history, right? Or even in equity, right? Uh, and so that's critical. Uh, if you're looking to engage and work with community, that that matters and their expertise and their experience is just as valuable as your degree and your research and your information. Yeah, and it, you bring up a really good point about, um, you know, who who's carrying the message and, you know, those kind of trusted, trusted messengers and some of our other roundtables about community engagement, our religious leader panel of someone being a trusted messenger. And that's, and as we've said many times, that comes from that, uh, building partnerships and continuous engagement. And um, as one of our other uh, uh, speakers mentioned, uh, you're making deposits into the community before you make a withdrawal. You, that you are, that you're building the community up as much as you can before you come in and asking for something. And again, we talk about trust and trustworthiness, and that's easier said than done, but that's how you, that's how you can create those partners, how you can overcome misinformation, overcome, the, uh, overcome that fear, but it does take time. Um, Julia, there was a question for you about an example of dissemination or implementation that you mentioned in your presentation. Yeah, I can do that. I'll do that example. And then I'll jump to the trust trifecta because trust is happening. Conversations are happening so much. I feel like that might be helpful. Um, so example of dissemination, classic example, you have a study, you want to share it, you send it out in a listserv. Another example, you put it on social media. Another example, you put it on a website. Maybe you create one pagers and distribute them to community partners, research partners, right? Like all those things are examples of dissemination practice. Examples of implementation practice are saying, we are actually going to work with these organizations, these communities to understand their needs and their gaps and pick strategies to actually help them. So we might come in, we're going to educate them. We're going to highlight champions within the organization. We're going to lead the implementation of a new best practice, right? So those are examples of implementation practices. And literally, I bet you everyone on this call does both of those things without calling it dissemination practice or implementation practice, right? Like the things we do in our everyday lives, sharing information or supporting people to actually change. Yeah, and I want to have, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, you're going to so share. Well. You're going to share the trust trifecta. I yeah. did have a follow-up question to some of those um, practices. When okay. We're running out of time. We're, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, but since this came up so much, I wanted to share because I think this is super. Because Joshua spoke to so many things here, that trust happens only if all three of these things are at play. You believe the other person is being authentic. That means being vulnerable, right? Not our first go-to place that we think of. Two, 
that you feel connection. That means things like you've identified shared values and you feel like people are being non-judgmental and that you believe they're competent and they believe, and you believe that they think you are competent. And it's only if all three of those things are happening that you trust people. And so I imagine you can like instantly play lots of relationships and be like, Ooh, that one's missing. That one's missing. That one's missing. And it explains why it's so hard to build trust, especially if people are showing up with judgment in the, like, if that's the place you start, it's going to be real hard to build trust because you've already crossed out connection from like the get go. So I think that that just wanted to share that. Yeah. And uh, you, you mentioned, you know, some of these dissemination practices and, and uh, at patients program, we've done, you know, some qualitative research on what is the best mechanism for dissemination. But is there any other research about, you know, I've seen some when it comes to fundraising that people think, well, what is put on social media and people just give us money. And that, in, you know, research has said that doesn't work. It raises awareness, but it doesn't convert people to action. Have you seen, or are there like evidence-based practices about if we're gonna talk about a certain health initiative and we wanna disseminate that, what are going to be the, you know, what's the evidence that these particular ways of getting the word out in this way are gonna be more effective than others? So that's where at the beginning, the very first image I shared was the, or one of the first images was the strategies tool. And so that's where I would literally sit down and say, okay, what is it you want people to do? You want people to donate? Okay, that's who is being asked to do it and what do you want them to do? And then from there you say, okay, well, what are their barriers? And then you use behavior change theory to select strategies. There is evidence that certain strategies work but you're never gonna find research studies at the level of, is this strategy going to work for X change? We just know that reminders work if they're addressing memory, right? So like that, you need to use evidence plus theory. And yep. people jokingly call it jumping off the cliff when you pick your strategies. Like it's a bit of an art meets science kind of uncomfortable space, let's say. No, that's understandable. Yeah, because I think that's people think like, well, we'll just do it this way because that's the way we've done it before without any evidence or backup or or any anything to to demonstrate that this is going to be an effective way of of, of this strategy is going to work in this context without any. It's like, well, we've always done it this way. Like, there's no mm -hmm. there's no um, uh, strategy, you know, behind it. So I think we're all back in the main room. Uh, so yep. a couple of comments. First of all, um, uh, you know, uh, there is a, a keen interest in receiving copies of the slides. Um, uh, so we will do that as well as um, uh, summarize all of the resources listed in chat. There were some questions and comments in chat that um, I know in our group we didn't get to. So uh, uh, we will take the time to go through those and, and provide some uh, 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 responses. Uh, and um, I think all of us as panelists and, and anyone, uh, you know, participants who, uh, you know, thinks of um, important resources over the, you know, coming hours and days, if you could please send them along so we can compile them as well and try to provide as much, um, you know, useful material as possible. Uh, any questions or comments or discussion points that came up during any of the groups that um, anyone would like to bring to the um, uh, the entire assembled uh, group? I know we had very uh, rich discussions and, and lots of important points and questions. Now, the other thing that I'd like to do is um, uh, ask the panelists for uh, any comments and reflections that um, uh, we all have, uh, you know, hearing from each other as well as, uh, you know, the breakout group discussions. Um, uh, and uh, also to offer any um, uh, sort of concluding thoughts and comments, uh, any requests that you would um, uh, uh, offer to um, uh, help, you know, essentially make the world a safer place for those of us interested in this. So I'll offer a few comments on the return of research results and what we hope you all will do. But um, uh, let me start, Julia, with you. Um, any concluding thoughts or, or requests uh, to your, your captive audience? Um, I would say, okay, so the thing I think I was most excited about is people are asking what I would consider kind of like cutting edge questions about some of these areas, right? Like really figuring out 
How can we embody equity? What are the ethical implications in our implementation work? What are some of the ethical implications? How can we make sure that people are being well treated, that they're being engaged appropriately and properly? And so I would say that's really exciting. I would say it's a little bit ahead of where the field is today. And that can sometimes feel daunting and overwhelming. But I would say it feels like there's a lot of momentum in that direction and that people should keep working on those things. I have been passionate about how you bridge implementation science and implementation practice for over a decade. And 10 years ago, no one wanted to talk to me about this at all, <laughs> right? Like at all. And now we like literally can't even contain how many people want to figure out how to bridge that gap. And so I would say, it's like, I think that there's a lot of momentum in this space. Don't be too discouraged, but just discouraged enough that you keep moving the needle forward in this area. I think that's my kind of concluding thought. Great, thank you. Uh, Isabel, again, your uh, concluding thoughts and any uh, requests to ask of your, uh, your captive audience. Wow, um, certainly. Um just want to thank everyone for participating and um i think what and i love what julia said and i, I want to second i know that's been my that, that told, agreed 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 and um and i think to add to that i think what really is at stake here is i find and coming again to sort of science and healthcare research as an outsider right not somebody who's trained in this field but i'm finding that we're at a critical moment where we really have to ask ourselves some really tough questions about you know, what do we want scientific research to look like and do for us moving forward? Because I don't think that, you know, and I think part of it is this high specialization within sciences, which is great because it's given us so much knowledge, but we're at this sort of, I find tipping point where if we continue down that path, I think we're going to lose the trust of public audiences. We're going to lose people. I think we already are. And we really have to re-envision how we talk about science, how we think of those other scientists and how we ultimately as a profession publish and disseminate our work. Because I think that the traditional scientific research article as useful as it is for some audiences has maybe reached a limit as the pivot, you know, the pivotal kind of genre of how we disseminate science. That's just, as a, and I, I heard a lot of people talk about that and I think going in that direction and that's sort of, you know, as we do that, my, my um, sort of uh, uh, task for myself and all of us is how do we then change the publishing landscape within our professions to really where, where lay summaries don't become an exception, but maybe the norm of dissemination as one example. Sure. Uh, Joshua, I don't uh, see that you've rejoined us yet, although uh, I'm not looking at both screens. Um, uh, if you are, um, uh, here, Brian. He's, he's, there he's you back. are. Okay, yeah, sorry. Back. Go ahead. Your your concluding thoughts and uh, uh, any requests. Yeah, no. Um, I think that this was a great conversation. Uh, I think that it's just important for us to remember um, that the goal of uh, our research is to serve populations, right? And if we can't reach them, um, then that hinders that goal, right? And so keeping those populations in mind on how we communicate with and how we engage them is critical uh, to building trust, not just for the, whatever current initiative you may be working on, but any future initiatives, because you will have a lasting footprint on that community, uh, on that individual for how they engage someone else in the future. Uh, and so I think that that's important to remember um, as well as that their experience, their lived experience is just as valuable to your work and your research. Uh, 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 and so keeping that in mind, uh, remember to always uh, lead with building that trust and engagement and not just when you need, but build long-term lasting sustainable relationships. Thank you. And I think what I have to say is probably just a restatement of, of, of those important points. Uh, you know, I think that the basis for this session, of course, is that we need more and better dissemination. Uh, right. We have to work much harder to make sure that the research that we all do uh, uh, gets out there, so to speak. 
um, and, and that has to be done in a fully stakeholder engaged collaborative manner. Um, you know, I think I said in the last breakout group that, you know, as a researcher uh, with a PhD in social science, I have absolutely no stature in most of the medical communities and most of the patient communities. Uh, we need the uh, results, the findings to be communicated and the advocacy to come from members of those communities. So, you know, I would like to think that I have a role to play in helping to plan and conduct dissemination, but more often than not, that should be a supporting role in that, um, you know, we need to be actively engaged with uh, members of the target audiences, uh, as I said, not only in designing and conducting uh, uh, the research and analyzing and interpreting results, uh, but equally, if not more importantly, in communicating those results. So important roles for stakeholders to play. And then my final request is back to the issue of return of research results. Again, it's the right thing to do. Uh, it is only slowly disseminating. We often say that uh, it takes 17 years for clinical practices uh, to emerge from research and, and be adopted widely. Uh, I hope that this uh, best practice in research that we return results to our participants does not take 17 years to uh, be widely adopted. We're trying to accelerate that process, maybe not 17 months, but perhaps seven years. So I would encourage all of you in whatever role you play in research, to ensure that uh, participants uh, receive the respect uh, in the ongoing communication engagement that they deserve and that we all um, uh, build into our uh, staffing plans and budgets and timelines and work plans, uh, you know, elements where we return either individual or aggregate results directly to our participants as a form of reciprocity and thanks. So uh, uh, we have just under 10 minutes. I'd like to turn the floor back to Joe, uh, to Hillary and others for uh, uh, your comments. Yeah, I'll turn it over to Hillary. Um, you know, we, we are gonna be working on a, uh, a project related to dissemination implementation. I'll let Hillary uh, here at Patients Program talk about that. Thanks, Joe. And thanks again to everyone, our panelists, to Brian as our moderator and our participants. Over these past five weeks, it's really hard to imagine um, that we're almost at the end of the Academy already. And so major kudos again to all of you who have engaged throughout these engaging sessions, both for um, the roundtable series and for our seminar and the activities in between. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Hillary Edwards. I'm one of the directors of research with the Patients Program and really excited that we've received a PCORI Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute engagement award uh, called SHOW, Shining Our Spotlight Wide, Advancing December Dissemination strategies through continuous engagement. And the idea is really what was presented here during today's discussion. So we had, you know, clearly diagrams, we have research, we have evidence that shows that dissemination and implementation can be done in a variety of ways from research and practice. Um, but often when it comes to investigators or researchers who uh, are putting together their proposals, they don't think about that end goal of how do we keep that timeline shortened so it's not 17 years from when we do research to when it enters into practice. And so uh, with some incredible uh, advisors, including Brian Mittman and Janice Tufte, who's on this call, um, we put together an advisory board to help us develop a virtual conference to engage patients, stakeholder partners, dissemination scientists, and other patient-centered outcomes research investigators on how to systematically address common barriers to continuous dissemination and research. That it's not just, we finished our study, now how do we share the results, but really thinking about that sharing and being intentional about uh, trust and trustworthiness and communication strategies with broad audiences uh, from the get-go. And so, um, you know, our goals from this conference will be to form and engage the stakeholder advisory board, co-develop that conference agenda, um, and then we hope to have our conference in early 2023 with a follow-up where hopefully many of you uh, will be interested not only in attending that conference, but a dissemination think tank on research and really looking at how do we take the critical questions that people are having in real time about dissemination and answer them during the research process, right? Like waiting until the end is not the time to figure out how to return the results. It's really about having that continuous discussion throughout because we also know that preferences may evolve. So as I think Brian said, take 17 years uh, if from research to enter practice, I think right now doubling of medical edu like information or education is two years, maybe less. Um, and so we don't have 17 years to get the most important information to people who are making those decisions. Um, so I know that's a lot of information. We'll make sure to share uh, information on show. I'll actually put our um, 
our information from the PCORI website into the chat. Um, but again, this is you know one step for us to really understand dissemination is not about the end, and it's really about continuous engagement through and through. And hopefully, uh, from for those of you who have attended just this roundtable session, to those of you who have attended all five weeks of the Patients Professors Academy, you can see how intertwined continuous engagement is with every step of the research process, uh, from the conception of a question all the way to returning those results to the community and beyond. Um, so that's my two cents. And Joe, I uh, turn it back to you. Yeah, uh, again, thank, thank you, Hillary. And uh, thank you to everyone on our panel and everyone for attending today and coming with your great questions and comments. Um, as I mentioned in the chat earlier, I will be sending out all of the links um, over the next few days, kind of um, process everything that, uh, that was shared um, in addition um, the recording of this roundtable should be available sometime next week, and I will um, uh, send that out, and everyone will have access to all of the roundtable recordings that we have. But um, I'd like to thank all of you, and um, I want you all to have a great week. Thank you. It's been thank wonderful. you all. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.